Hi, this is Marianne Monaraj. I'm here with Ajit George and SB Divya, and we're here for the Speculative Literature Foundation at World Fantasy Convention in Los Angeles 2019. And I'm going to talk to them a little bit about what they do in science fiction fantasy and sort of what they're, how they got into the field and what they're working on next. So um, maybe, Ajit, if you could start with a little bit about um, how did you come into the genre? What is it that you do, et cetera? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um... I came into the genre first uh, by going to Clarion West, and that was in 2004. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a huge fan of science fiction and fantasy, and I think uh, I was the first child born in the U.S. and felt very alienated by maybe a lot of traditional literature in science fiction and fantasy allowed me to imagine other ways and other possible roles for myself. Mm -hmm. um, but um, And were you born in the U.S.? Yeah, or? I was the first child born in the U.S., um, born in New York. Mm. Um, so And your family's from... Uh, my f parents are from Kerala. Okay. Yeah. And um, after Clarion, I my full time work kind of took over. Um, I'm director of oper director of operations of an NGO that's based in India. Um, but I kind of returned to the genre more through games mm -hmm. and started writing games from the perspective of uh, an Indian American um, because there was like next to no representation of Indians mm -hmm. or. Uh, South Asians at all in games and yeah. kind of been working in that for a while and then uh, now working on a novel um, based really on my work, uh, my full-time profession. Okay, we're going to come back to that. Yeah. Um, but um, SB, if you could introduce your own background and how you came into the genre. Sure, so um, my background is that I have been a lifelong reader of science fiction fantasy and a fan. I started writing a little bit in my teens and gave it up when I went off to college to be a scientist and then an engineer, mm -hmm. um, being the good South Asian that I am, but also because I love those subjects. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> I kind of dropped writing for a long time, and after having a child and kind of losing myself a little bit for a mm -hmm. few years, I decided to reclaim some of that for myself and that passion and try to get published, and this all happened. Um, just back in 2013, my first flash fiction piece got published by a daily science fiction in 2014. I started writing primarily in short fiction, science fiction and fantasy, and then I uh, was very fortunate to have a novella picked up and released as a standalone book. And that was Runtime. And that was Runtime. Which I loved. I thought it was just terrific. It was a great, fast-paced, uh, exciting read with some really interesting ideas. And and now that's out again, not just as an independent novella, but you have a collection out. Is that out yet? Yes. So I also um, very recently was approached by Hachette India to mm -hmm. publish a collection of my short fiction in the Indian subcontinent mm -hmm. in English. And that came out at the end of August and is available. Uh, as far as I know, in all the major bookstores and all the major cities uh, within India. So within that's India. super exciting. Yes. That is super <laughs> exciting. Um, and congratulations. Thank it you. does make me like really frustrated because I want to read it. And so um, if maybe if you could talk a little bit for those who uh, are not familiar, it seems like there are there are right now still like big barriers between uh, publishing in India versus here. It's not like, I feel like if a book comes out in the U.S., at least you know, at least a fair number of books also come out in the U.K., right? And you can still get them in Australia and so on, um, and vice vice versa to some extent. Maybe not for extent. Australia, yeah. So and yeah. for for India, it seems like it's mostly flowing from the U.S. to India, but not the other way. Is that fair? Uh, that is definitely fair. Yeah. I don't think there's a lot coming back from India to the U.S. There might be more coming from India to the U.K. Mm. Um, and vice versa. I feel like we need people like publishers to go and hunt up what's being published in India and and bring it over and bring it over here, right? I so. think so. Based on the sort of bookstore browsing I did while mm -hmm. I was there um, back in January of this year, there is uh, the big the sort of bestseller. Uh, genre fiction in India right now is mythology inspired mm. retellings. So novelizations of, you There's know, a Ramayana. minor, well, no, even just of minor characters from some of the epics, right? Oh, interesting. And um, just taking different perspectives mm -hmm. on those. And I think some of them are, are really, really interesting, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and kind of diving into the motivations and all the things that the epics never really do. Mm -hmm. That becomes, I think, culturally challenging to bring over to the U.S. because people don't have that rooted context of 
what you're deconstructing, which right. these books very much are doing. So like the so like as a parallel then like Marion Zimmer Bradley, which she did with Miss of Avalon, where she took the matter of sure. Britain and did a feminist version, it's easy for people to access because they're already like our culture is based on the Arthurian mythos and that, that right. whole background, right? right? And if people don't have that context, exactly. Yeah, that's yeah, that's super interesting. <laughs> we were talking about um, uh, Jonathan Strange and, and Mr. Mr. Norrell, and yeah. I was like, it didn't speak to me personally much because I've not been steeped in Fae mm. and Gaelic, you know, mythos, and so I just I had a really hard time getting into that book, and mm -hmm. I know so many people who love it, and it just it didn't work for me. So I think. Having that context sometimes is necessary, but I've also heard from people in India that you know Bollywood is getting very interested in science fiction, especially right mm. now, and that the genre field is growing. And I think that's partly why Hachette India came to me, not because they're expecting my collection of English, you know, mostly American-centric mm -hmm. science fiction and fantasy to sell well and become a bestseller in India, but I hope more, it does. <laughs> <laughs> more just to establish my name is really right. what they wanted to do and hopefully, you know, have me be like a good crossover author that can kind of bridge that gap, right? And we yeah. have uh, we have a few others who are doing that yeah. those mods time, right? We, you know, we have Anil Menon, we have Landana Singh, we have Priya Sharma. Yeah. Um, so much like what's happened with uh, the Chinese science fiction world, I think there needs to be a twofold growth, a, a local growth within India of right. authors within India, and then the diaspora kind of going back and forth. Yeah, and I think there are more. I mean, I was just hearing there's like a second. I want to say Sri Lankan science fiction fantasy literary festival. Like, oh, wow. like, okay. like, or you know, maybe it's not science fiction fantasy, but a second literary festival. Like, there was for a long time just the Gall Lit Fest. Now there's another one, and that's promising, right? Like, right. let it let it yeah. grow. Let there be more publishing houses. Let there be. Um, Preponderous. I'm curious. Are you familiar with uh, Nina 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 Paley's uh, Sita Sings the Blues? I'm gonna. Yes. Yeah. And I, I wonder what you think. Anyway, maybe maybe this is a complicated question, but I, I think would need to revisit it. Yeah, yeah. But it's but, an, while, but, but it's interesting because it's another like it's a it's a Ramayana take, but it's coming out of um, you know a, a woman from the West taking who has ties to India, um, redoing this this really inter I thought it was a very interesting film. Um, version of the Ramayana as this animated film. So, okay, let me, I'm going to redirect and um, turn, it, turn it to Ajit. If you could talk a little more in specific about your, like, the games you've worked on that are maybe relevant to all this sure. and uh, and your uh, nonprofit work and yeah. connect that to the novel, maybe. <laughs> yeah, um, growing up with games was sort of my uh, pathway to self-exploration, um, uh, building my own confidence. Role playing allows you to explore identities that are not your own, but also to maybe form your identity better. Um, with a lack of maybe fear that you're going to be judged because you're not playing yourself, you're playing a character. And so you can experiment with how your voice may sound um, and who you are. And as, um, as a brown kid growing up in a deeply uh, white uh, set of schools and communities, I felt alienated constantly and really, really had a hard time with it. Um, it was very, very painful for me growing up. And um, role playing games were one of the few refuges, along with books, uh, mm -hmm. that I could find um, that gave me my own space and my own voice and to experiment. But all of these role playing games were like made by. Um, by older white men that had mm -hmm. no context of my own lived experience. It's like kind of classic D and D. Sure, you know, exactly. Alex a lot of D and D. Yeah. Um, I eventually moved to stuff like from White Wolf, which is um, more like '90s Gothic mm -hmm. horror, and that was great, um, and a little bit better about gender representation, but not about people of color, specifically not about Indians. Mm -hmm. And um, a little, in the last couple of years, I got back into gaming, and. Um, you know, the field hadn't really changed a whole lot. Mm -hmm. uh, there was some exoticization of Eastern culture or Southeastern culture or South Asian culture, but not uh, any great representation and not being written by, um, you know, people of color or Indians. Mm -hmm. And um, I started approaching some of these game designers and said, hey, like, you know, this is, this is a real issue. This is a problem. Um, and weirdly, I think maybe times have just changed. Yeah. And so they were, they were like, Okay, would you like to write for us? Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, yeah, I will. <laughs> I'd be happy to do so. Um, and so I think I wrote 
Um, role playing games are especially, um, especially White Wolf was really famous for their city guides, and D and D also has like the city of Waterdeep or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but they're all like Western cities or Western inspired cities, and so I wrote, as far as I know, the first city guide to the city of Bangor, um, mm -hmm. and what that looked like uh, from a supernatural perspective. Um, I also explored uh, class and caste issues through it. Um, and I go to Bangalore uh, twice a year. I've been doing it for the last decade of my life. So I know the city pretty well and it's seen its evolution and that was really exciting. Um, I wrote for another game called Misspent Youth, which is sort of like, uh, it's kind of an outgrowth of a punk movement of like, you know, taking on the, the machine or the man or the government. And, um, but I took it from rural, I wrote a, a piece um, about five women living in rural India and the struggles they had against rural patriarchy, um, their husbands, um, the, the chicken farm that they worked for. And really, I, I know these stories personally because I, that's the communities that I work with. Mm -hmm. So I was able to speak authentically from my witnessing of that. Um, that they're not my lived stories myself, but I've been as close as I can as an NGO worker working directly with that communities. That was incredibly powerful too. Um, and, yeah. Sorry, I was going to ask if you could, for people who don't know your organization sure. and, and what you do. Yeah, um, I work with the Shanti Robin Children's Project. I'm its director of operations, and we work with uh, marginalized communities, uh, mostly Dalit or untouchable communities within South, uh, South India um, that are under the poverty line. So, multiple levels of marginalization, uh, caste discrimination, and then, of course, income or class issues. 50% um, of our community are women, so uh, there's gender discrimination as well. Um, and there, the complexities of problems that they face are so uh, enormous that it's hard to, you know, add, you know, encompass. But a lot, of, a lot of different complexities there. Maybe can you talk a little bit about how has, I mean, I know it has, but the ways in which South Asian culture makes its way into your work, um, into your fiction writing. Yeah. So, Let's go yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, I think that the biggest one is one that's not immediately obvious, and that is that it's thematic, it's family, mm -hmm. and the importance of family in someone's life uh, that's often not reflected in Western science fiction and fantasy, which is very much about the individual. Uh, I actually, yeah, sorry no, to interrupt, but I just. I just watched the first episode of Raising Dion. Oh which yes, is, and uh, so you, have, have you seen I saw, it yet? I saw the first episode. It, yeah. No, but the the I was one thing that I was watching it with with Chad, and one thing he commented on is that this uh, black woman is in, who is has a, a young son with superhero powers is she's embedded in community. She's surrounded by people who care for her, and which is really rare to see in. Um, like we're, we're starting to see a little more ensemble stuff, but like the classic Western superhero, often like all the family has fallen away, Batman right. is alone, you know, right. he's gonna maybe got a servant, but that's it, right? right. And uh, so she's surrounded by that, and they still can't help her because this is such a huge thing that's beyond anything they've ever experienced, but it's been, it was really, it was a really interesting thing, and even in, when I, when I teach, um, writers of color in science fiction and fantasy, one of the things that I've noticed with the, Latin American writers, Latinx writers, is that family is huge in their yeah. story, more so than in, in anything else, I've, any other area that I've seen. Um, yeah. And that's a, I don't know, it's a really yeah. interesting um, element. Yeah. You were speaking better about it than that's I am. Okay. So, so <laughs> yes, but it's just, it's, it's, it's striking. It's a, it's, it is, and I think uh, there are a lot of cultures that are writing in genre fiction now where that's being brought forward. Uh, family, friendships, um, and then in terms of direct South Indian influence, there are specific stories I've written that are mm -hmm. set, you know, in, uh, in Trichy, mm -hmm. Trichy, in uh, Bangalore, in um, ancient India. And uh, I think that's, it, it always kind of creeps in, you know, there's always some character in the story that is either uh, overtly or subtly has a piece of my background and myself in that character otherwise it doesn't feel like um, my story and so sometimes it's subconscious sometimes it's very very conscious decision but uh, always there is something there and I think 
I think that's true for everybody, you know, yeah. regardless of what your background is, it's going to turn up and you know, whether you're aware of it or not. Yeah, no. When my, when my characters have to decide whether to like go and stage a raid to protect the alien encampment, they stop and like fry samosas first, right? Like <laughs> it's, good. it's the middle of the night, you must feed everyone and then go, yeah. right? So, um, Ajit, maybe do you want to... Yeah, sure. I, I feel like I, we're all on the same page yeah. here because community is huge to me and I think uh, I'm, I know I'm very challenged by uh, a Western individualistic uh, point of view, the lone hero that goes and often saves the day. Um, I think this is both a problematic tale and, a, and also a unrealistic tale. Um, and I think that's how we get a nation that believes that billionaires are great. Uh, they're sort of the lone heroes that have taken over the world. <laughs> and the, the rest of the population really doesn't matter because they're sort of the backdrop to their, to their stories of Jeff Bezos or something like that. And I, um, I really fight against them. I don't believe in that. I am very community-based, family-based for sure, but even deeper, uh, weirdly, is actually larger communities. I really, really believe in the community, and my storytelling really goes around community-based uh, ideas. Um, I, have, yeah. I have a question, though, maybe to flip on this a little bit, maybe, yeah. is that, you know, I write a lot of queer characters and so on that, are, that maybe don't go over so well with the more traditional conservative Sri Lankan family community, yeah. right? Um, do you, and maybe this takes it to diaspora a little bit, like um, how is your work received in those communities and do you ever feel like, you know, maybe you're, you're, you are bringing some Western, some American ideas into the work as well that maybe they are not relating to so much or they find pernicious, <laughs> I don't know. So, I, um... So I'll speak to runtime for this because okay. there's uh, there's a component in there, you know, right on page one. There's their gender pronouns, mm -hmm. and there are um, characters who are non-binary, and there are characters who will identify with a different gender label that I made up for science fictional purposes. Mm -hmm. But I have had my um, like eighty-something uh, family friend, former godparent in America read it and um, enjoy it and start trying to use third person yeah. oh. gender <laughs> pronouns in his email to me about it. And then I also had, you know, uncles, like actual uncles, not figurative mm -hmm. uncles, um, in India read my work uh, and respond very favorably. And they were, you know, they admitted that they didn't quite get all of it, but they were kind of like, this is really cool that you're writing about this thing. I've never heard about it. And there's some words here that I don't really, I'm not entirely sure I know in spite of yeah. being well-educated in English. But there was no pushback. Yeah. Um, well, that's lovely. I'm sure there are I, people I, I, somewhere I, I, who I got hate would. mail, but yeah. yeah, so. yeah. Uh, but yeah, at yeah. least from within my family and you know, sort of immediate circles, I have not seen any pushback. And um, I'm curious. It I want to ask you about class a little bit. Was so when I was first writing, I was a student in an MFA program with Gina Kamani, um, who, you know, is a, a she wrote Jungly Girl, and it was one of the first South Asian short story collections that um, had it had sexuality, uh, pretty overt, and uh, just I don't know, it blew me away. I was like, how did you have the courage to write this, right? You know, and and she kind of looked at me bewildered because she came from I would say a, an upper class I think Bombay family and you know her parents proudly came to her readings and they loved that she wrote about this and they had no issues yeah. with it and I was like oh my parents had some issues <laughs> right yeah. so I don't know it's a, I, I wonder whether I, I, maybe it's just you know individual family reactions or I wonder whether class factors into this to some extent as well or religion. I'm sure it all yeah. goes it, into yeah. it you know how conservative is your family and not just class but the yeah. other C word that no one wants to talk about which is caste yeah. right. Yeah. right. Um, I come from the privileged caste in India which is really interesting coming from being a Brahmin there not wealthy but mm -hmm. well educated and then coming, you know, to the U.S. as an immigrant and being part of the the outcast part of society, mm -hmm. right? And not as included in the mainstream. Um, so I think, yeah, definitely all of that informs it. I I have a distinct memory from a story I was writing in college uh, before I gave up writing to be a physicist, um, <laughs> and I was working on it over break at home. And my mom peeks over my shoulder and 
it wasn't even sexuality. It was just the F word. Mm. And she's like, why you got to do that? She's like, why do you have to use this language, you know, in your stuff? And I was just kind of like, okay. So I can't work on this year because I can't be, yeah. you know, my authentic self. Um, she's over it now. They're swearing at my stuff. It's all good. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I think, you know, those constraints are definitely there. And especially when you're, when you're starting out, like if you're trying to please everyone, including your family, it's going to, you're going to have a hard go of it. Yeah. yeah. Do yeah, I was such a rebellious kid growing up that um, uh, now they're just sort of happy that I will have conversations with them and not be in an in, in argument with them. And, uh, I think they're pretty accepting. My game writing, like, I haven't shown them because I just feel like they aren't going to get it and understand it. Right. Uh, my mom stalks me, and so, like, she's picked up on some of it already anyway. Um, and she bought my wife's book, uh, uh, RPG, which was pretty on the nose of, like, feminine and gothic addressing this stuff and she doesn't quite get it uh, but like I'm like if my mom can like read my wife's work then she'll probably read mine but as I work in this novel I am cognizant and worried a little bit about how they're going to take some stuff especially since it's so close to home with my work uh, which is connected to them as well so there are some fears there uh, but I'm also like I gotta write this thing and, and this it'll be what it'll be and um, hopefully they'll be okay with it you know all right, I'm going to ask you one more question, which is because we don't have a lot of time much of us to get to the airport, sadly. Um, but if you could talk maybe a little bit about, for, for people who might be watching this or listening to this from South Asia, um, a little about the publishing industry. Did you find barriers to publication? Do you feel like it was harder for you as uh, someone of South Asian descent here in America? Or do you think, or you know, yeah. was it fine? And, and are there going to be even more barriers for someone from South Asia? still living there? I think um, I think there are barriers for any person of color. Um, I think there are deep barriers for any person of color. And I think about this question really deeply uh, from multiple angles. And I think, um, I, I, I tweeted about this, that like 70 to 85% of all jobs are gotten by, because of a network or a connection. Mm -hmm. um, simultaneously, um, uh, Every, for every uh, black person that they have a friend, uh, white people have like 91 white friends. Um, and then 75% of America has no, uh, that are white, have no people of color in their, in their world. Uh, publishing industry is like any other business, mm -hmm. and that means connections, networks, um, uh, being able to like be in the room at a con, mm -hmm. that means income uh, to be able to go to a con, there are multiple challenges. Uh, so. Uh, when I first started out, I felt very daunted and it was like I had no roadmap. Uh, I'm older now, I'm pretty savvy about how these things work, so like I have a leg up and I feel like I'm not too worried about getting my novel out there when the time comes. But then there's marketing, there's all sorts of other challenges there, um, and I'm really thinking about that. But I do think I have an advantage of like a lot of groundwork, and I think it would be deeply challenging for like a young South Asian author to make inroads without support systems and without being taught um, and without being uh, networked in the right way. I, I think the industry is like any other industry and you've got to be very savvy to navigate it successfully or you'll be stymied for many years. And I have to note here, uh, last December I was visiting Sri Lanka and I met a bunch of Sri Lankan science fiction fantasy writers, uh, Yudanjaya Vijaratna, Naveen Viratna, um, Mandy Jayatisa, and they, um, and, and you then, I ended up having a lot of conversations. He was a Nebula nominee last year, and uh, he, uh, he and I, uh, along with some other people, set up a Facebook group for South Asian science fiction fantasy. So anyone listening to this, come find us. Uh, look for, I don't remember the name of the group, but look for South Asian SF. It should come up, and, and because I think that's so important. If you can't make it to a convention, but being able to exchange advice, to ask questions, um, because there's a lot of misinformation out there too. Yeah, I mean, right? you've been supportive of me. Like, yeah. you, you answered a ton of questions for me and were incredibly informative. I think you provided a service. I think we were both joking that you're like the mother hen who takes everybody in your way. <laughs> I mean, you really Auntie do. That's fine. You, you, you're very intentional about it. Like, you are yeah. very caring. I think you find the South Asians are like kind of like adrift and you try to pull them in. And I you do, but you know. So there weren't any, there were very few South Asians in the field when I came. I mean, Vandana Singh and Anil Menon were writing, but I hadn't okay. met them. They were yeah. not at conventions and so on. And so, um, yeah, but, yeah, yeah, but they, um, but uh, 
other people of color did take care of me. So in, in fact, at this con, I got to see Nalo Hopkinson, yeah. who is an Afro-Caribbean Canadian writer. And she was at my first WISCON, and she helped us form the Carl Brandon Society for Writers of Color in the field. And you know, there were five people of color at that, five writers of color at that WISCON, and now they have a POC dinner every year that has hundreds of people 20 yeah. years later. And so there's a, you know, and I, I wouldn't have been there if WISCON hadn't actually hadn't actively made outreach. I was a broke grad student and could not possibly have afforded to go, and they were like, we will fly you out. And so there's also a way in which these, um, some of these established um, minority, ma majority white organizations are doing very conscious active outreach as well. Yeah. Um, Divya, do you want anything to add? On? Okay. Yeah, I will say that so. in my personal experience, I have been fortunate not mm -hmm. to feel any obvious barriers. Um, I think I have, because I kind of came into this fairly late, mm -hmm. a lot of those barriers have been broken down by mm -hmm. people who've come before me. And the conversations were already happening about own voices and diversity. And so I happen to be catching that wave, so I'm Great. lucky. Um, but I will say that there is another side of this, and that is, uh, so I'll, I'll put my editor hat on, mm -hmm. right? And I'm currently co-editor at Escape Pod. But how I got there is interesting, and people had to open those doors. And you know, the first door that was opened was uh, Rachel K. Jones reaching out to me through an online writers group and saying, "Will you come slush for us? Like, mm -hmm. I would like to have you." And I was, you know, as with many of us, uh, overburdened with writing, with mm -hmm. family life, with a job. Uh, but I said, you know what? This is an opportunity, and I should probably say yes and at least try mm -hmm. it. And so I did. And a year later, uh, Norm Sherman, who is very much straight white male, uh, said, hey, our assistant editor is stepping back for reasons, and we would love to have you step into that role. Yeah. Yeah. Will you come? And I was kind of like, same, you know, same thought process. Okay, well, can I handle the commitment? Can I deliver? But I thought, yes, I should. And so I became assistant editor. And assistant editor is a very interesting role because in our structure, at least, the assistant editor is the gatekeeper between general submissions of short stories from authors from anywhere mm -hmm. to who gets passed up to the editor-in-chief mm -hmm. and who ultimately gets published. And so sitting in that role, for me, that's a privileged position, but it started giving me ideas. You know, there's things that come through that I'm gonna see with a different lens. Mm -hmm. and. By having the background that I do and sort of the consciousness that I have and the experiences that I have, I said, yeah, I want to now be the person opening doors for people because I'm sitting at that door. And a year or so after that, uh, Norm said, hey, I need to step back for reasons. Would you like to be editor? And I said, sure, but I really need help. <laughs> <laughs> so I brought, you know, so I asked Merle Lafferty if she would come back and help mm. me and, and she very graciously. And, and happily accepted and you know we've been going on since but again yeah. now sitting in the editor's chair like I'm the ultimate gatekeeper right I get to decide and you with have now her. bought a story of mine which I'm super grateful delighted yes. to have it at escape pod <laughs> so you know it all it rolls works around, out right, right? Like, so. you know and I go out and I try to be um, more intentional about soliciting stories mm. from authors outside of the US and sometimes it's hard you know just getting um, payments to them, mm -hmm. it can be challenging, right? I've and discovered that some writers are fine with Amazon gift cards as a as an option, which has been an interesting, like trying to figure out how to pay them. Right. Can be if they don't have PayPal, if yeah. you know they're the checks fee can be very expensive. Yeah, for sure. Wire transfers so, are not always accessible. Ex yeah. Exactly. Um, so. so but but I think it's worth worth doing and I'm again very lucky that the people who own all of these podcasts and manage the money which are escape artists which is Alistair Stewart and Marguerite Kenner are extremely intentional about making these things happen mm -hmm. and I have their 100% support both you know for gender for people of color for people international yeah. writers and so and I think all of that is important right like you have everyone all the way to the top saying yes like we want to do this we want to enable people to make these decisions to help people come in. And that is really, really important, right? It's not just about the authors being able to break through, mm -hmm. but it's also about the 
publishers and the gatekeepers being willing to open that gate and saying, please come in, right. uh, we yeah. want you, and to reach out to specific people and ask for their work. Because a lot of them assume that nobody in the U.S. would be interested, yeah, right? Sure. Yeah, that, that is, that's, I heard that over and over, and it was like, where is that perception coming from, right? But it's coming from like but, yeah. Hollywood and yeah. pop culture, right? Like, right. You don't... Yeah, the, the absence of, yeah. of, of I mean, we're any not voices. There. Yeah, 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 we're not there. Yeah. So, all right. Well, I, I don't want you to miss your flight. So, <laughs> <laughs> we're now, we'll close with if I could ask you to just remind the audience of um, maybe one thing of yours that you'd love them to go check out, and maybe a recommendation of somebody else's work that you have really enjoyed lately that you'd like to recommend. So. Sure. Um, I'd love people to check out our organization, the Shanti Baba Children's Project. Uh, that would be the best, because I think I'm really proud of that work. Uh, but you could look at uh, Misspent Youth and, and the work I did there. Uh, that game was uh, really proud of what, what I did with that. Um, sorry, what was the second part of the question? Someone you'd recommend, but maybe we'll switch to Yeah, yeah you can think yeah. about that. Uh, and you can think about that. Um, I, uh, for myself, I would say, um, I would love for people in the subcontinent to check out my collection. It is called, it's a very long title. It's called Contingency Plans for the Apocalypse and Other Possible Situations. <laughs> um, and it is a collection of almost all of my short fiction, including an original piece, as well as the Nebula nominated runtime, which I know is harder to get in India, though you can buy it on Amazon. It's and expensive. I feel like I saw a collection in at in at Worldcon from a from another press in like not a, for me not from you no. interesting we should talk mm. and um, uh, in terms of recommendation and this is as half plugging me but half plugging someone else uh, I was recently very happy to run a reprint story originally from Fireside but we we're running it in Escape Pod it is free to listen to and read and it is called Light and Death on the Indian Battle Station by mm -hmm. Kan Bose. And it is a uh, Diwali story set in space with telepaths and incorporates one of my favorite mythological stories from my youth as well, which is that of Savitri and Sahira. Mm -hmm. oh, that's excellent. Lovely. That's awesome. Um, I'm just going to plug my wife's game, Gabriel's <laughs> Pride. Uh, it won a bunch of awards, and I'm incredibly proud of her and the work that she did with it. And her name is? Uh, uh, Whitney Bokan. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a great, fantastic game, I think. Um, it sort of opened a bunch of doors for her in, in, in narrative writing, so it's, it's worth taking a look. All right, thank yeah. you so much. Ajit George, SP Divya, um, just a delight having you. Thanks. Thanks thank for you. Having you.